welcome in co-host Bill Stubblefield, the Admiral. Hello, sir. Good morning, Rob. Great to be here as always. Hey, it's wonderful to have you. Yeah, And it's been fun this morning watching Maria get ready to come on air. And fumble with the with the headphones. Yeah, it's and the only microphone. been yeah, yeah, all kinds of stuff. It's so. important that we have your shirt on because you had yes. said you would wear the Queen Bee shirt before. I I wore it once before, but because mm. I'm not going into work today, I'm a little a um, little more casual than usual. So yeah. I I found the Queen Bee again and and put her back on. You and Beyonce. And Bill Cowers' new wife. There you go. Uh, everybody, the queen. That's your triumvirate of queen bees. Yeah, and I, this was Bill's um, moniker for me. So well, it's, it fits, fits, Maria. Well, after about twenty-seven other variations. Um, <laughs> Emlo. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I like Emlo. Emlo's cool. Yeah, yeah. Right. but the bee is is pretty cool too. Yeah. City of Martinsburg had its elections yesterday, and all of the incumbents won. And there was one seat that would have been a, a new member because Corey Roman wasn't returning to the council seat. And that seat was taken by Heidi Gibbons Crawford, who finished with the second most votes in the council at large race. Uh, Steve Knipe and Heidi Crawford will be the at large council people. The Ward 1 race went to the incumbent Dennis Etherington, who beat Christopher Morris by 10 points. In Ward 4, Kimberly Nelson, the incumbent, beat David Carroll by uh, six plus and the mayor kevin knowles beat yvonne jenkins by uh, nearly 15 points in that race for mayor so all of the incumbents plus one newcomer uh returning to uh be city of martinsburg with, leadership with a pitiful um voter turnout i couldn't again. find numbers for that any idea what it was um 805 people and i believe um i believe it was Either four percent or seven percent. Oh, even but, worse than usual. Oh yeah, because way worse. Eight or ten is what you usually. Yeah, get. yeah. So but, all right, way to go, four percent of you. But, <laughs> but this was the strangest elections that I have seen observed. And again, we've talked yesterday about this that so much of the campaign was done on social media, uh, and if you follow social media, probably you could get it, became engaged with it. The ones of us that do not follow social media, it seemed like a kind of a non-campaign session. Bunch of signs. Yeah. That was but, it. But oh. now the, there are a few people that appeared on radio with you, Rob. And yeah, I want to. Okay, I'm sorry. Go right just ahead. Just to say here is we welcome in John Hardy. John, good morning. <laughs> good Joe, morning. Thank good you morning. For, yeah, thank you for having me this morning. Uh, let, let's go by the those who spoke to our audience on this program and those who did not, how they did. Kevin Knowles spoke to our audience on this show. One opponent, Vaughn Jenkins, did not speak to our audience on this show. Lost. Uh, all the at-large people appeared on the show. Uh, Ward 1, Dennis Etherington came on this program, spoke to our audience. He won. Christopher Morez did not. He lost. Ward 4, Kimberly Nelson came on this program, spoke to our audience. She won. Uh, David Carroll did not. He lost. I bring this point up for this reason only. This audience is not to be taken lightly or for granted. This is an educated, diverse audience it's not just Republicans. It's not just Democrats. It's not just independents. It's a voting audience. Yeah, it's going to say engage. They're engaged. If you choose to skip this audience, and this is not me. It could be anybody hosting this program. It's the audience. If you choose to skip this audience, you make that decision and you deal with the end result of that. Period. End of story. And there's a great example of it here today. Mr. Hardy. Pleasure to have you, sir. Thank you for having me. And, yeah, that's very well said. I mean, I, I have been on this show many, many, many times, and I find it very interesting. Uh, I find it exciting to come onto a show and not really know what you're going to be asked. And, and uh, you know, there's some people we that – We feel the same way. Jim. Yeah, and there's, and there's some people that feel really comfortable with that, and there's some people that are that really terrifies them. So, uh, But, you know, your all show has, has been gaining strength across the state. I mean, I've spoken to many elected officials across the state who says that, uh, you know, this is the best – uh, morning show they come on it has you guys give them time to explain you always have good questions and so uh, I mean I've heard that from the speaker I've heard it from the Senate president I've heard it from delegates and senators across the state so you guys should be very proud of what you do here and and have a very uh, engaged um, group of listeners that uh, really dial into this radio station and TV 10 every morning to see what's going on uh, locally and across the state. So that's something to be very proud of. Well, as I said, this audience, this audience does not buy BS easily. 
they are cynical. They ask good questions. They are investigative. And they see through smoke screens for content. And if you're going to come on this program, or not, as the case may be in some situations, and try to BS your way through it, they sniff it out pretty quickly. It's a smart audience. Well, and I think what I appreciate, too, is oftentimes, at least Bill and I, will go to the questions that people in the Facebook chat ask mm -hmm. because they're, um, they're valid questions and they, they need answering and you know, then that makes our job a little easier. Yeah, so. Rob, before we get involved in the meat of the uh, morning, I'd like to give a shout out to John and his wife, Sally. They had their anniversary this past weekend. Yeah, Saturday was our 28th wedding anniversary. Mm -hmm. So uh, me and Sally dated for seven years before we got married because we were so incredibly young when we met. Uh, I was 16, she was 15. Mm -hmm. So we were high school sweethearts. We dated all through high school and college. And uh, when she graduated college and I got out of the Army, we got married, and we've been together for uh, a very long time and have had a very loving relationship, and uh, we are very, very close, and she's my best friend, and I tell everybody that. So. Congratulations, thank, John. Thank you, Bill. 28 that. years is nothing to sneeze at. No. I got you beat, though. Yeah. 40 this right. weekend. That's awesome. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. John, you were motivated to call the program last week, and we made a rare Friday show exception to put you on the program, too. We usually don't go outside of the Friday Five uh, but we did in your particular case uh, because of some things that you wanted to address with spending and appropriations out of the uh, House of Delegates and the, the Senate. Uh, ultimately, those things become law when the governor signs them and put them into, puts them into play. But the flatline budget is something that's been batted back and forth by both sides. Not, not that there's much of a side left of the Democratic Party, uh, but they've been very critical of it, and even some members of the Republican Party have. But you uh, rallied to the defense of it in your call. Yeah, I've defended that, you know, the flatline budget. It was in place when I got there. So I got in the legislature and in, in, uh, I was elected in 2018. So 2019 was my first legislative session. Uh, the flatland budget had been, you know, in place for a while, and and I bought into that pretty quickly. Uh, as the more as I went through the finance committee and uh, garnered more information and and more understanding of how that worked, and I understood, you know, what was behind that, and and you know, a lot of people have taken credit for the flatline budget and in implementing that, but there's no one who's been stronger uh, in implementing that than than. Uh, Eric Householder. Eric Householder was really the person that, you know, put that together and, and as the finance chairman really tried to get everyone to buy into the flatline budget. And and it was I just wanted to explain that the flatline at some point in time there there is going to be a, a period when we are going to have to start to spend more money and most likely in, in certain agencies. But I just wanted to say in the last, you know, ten years or eight years that the flatline budget has done very well of squeezing out efficiencies in agencies Agencies that really made agencies uh, work within what they their allotted funds. They had to go back in and really do some uh, some some digging and uh, do some soul searching in their expenditures. And I think that that did really squeeze out um, some of the areas where they would just continually ask for more money. So I've I've been in favor of that uh, you know since I've been in the legislature and and I just wanted to you know to pull that out and make sure that people understood what we were doing. And when we do these type budgets, it does leave these large uh, surpluses, and then we can take those surpluses. Um, it would be nice if we could return a little more of those surpluses to uh, the taxpayer, uh, but you know, typically the more money we have sitting around, it's going to get spent somewhere. So when we leave those monies in the surpluses, the legislature has a little bit more say. Uh, not you know, we have a very strong governor in this state. The the executive branches uh, carries a lot of power. So when we can keep those surpluses, you you give that say to a larger group of people on how that money is going to be spent in one time expenditures. Yeah, John, you made a good point, and I think that the fact that uh, some of the inefficiencies have been squeezed out, but my view is this is a function that the legislators should do as a matter of course. Every year, you should take a hard look at every individual agency, and you should be able to recognize inefficiencies there. The disadvantage of a flatline budget, and the first three or four years, I think you're exactly right, but there's going to be uh, certain agencies that are going to have less fat going in than others. And some of those agents are very critical. I think we saw it with DHHR, uh, Child Protective Services. I yell to the fact there's more to it than just budget, but the budget was underlined uh, a lot of this. So I think 
with all the benefits you get from a uh, flatline budget, there are certain disadvantages, and this is where I think a legis- the legislators come into play by taking a hard look at every agency and making the value judgment. Yeah, I will tell you every year since I've been involved in the legislature and been on the finance committee, now since I became the vice chair of finance, I don't do it as much as I used to, but I would pick one or two agencies and I would do a deep dive myself yeah, on yep. those agencies and I can tell you agencies like Bureau of Senior Services they, they never have enough money right our senior centers our programs for our seniors they never have enough money um, the two biggest bloated agencies that we have is, is the old DHHR which now is DH, DAS or DHS I'm sorry um, and there's a couple other smaller entities in that uh, so and and, uh, and education. So those together are almost you know a little over four billion, almost four billion dollars. Um, I'm not sure if some of those agencies have funding and issues as more as they have fundamental uh, issues in 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 how they are operating. Um, you know, the the school board, the state school board, is really the legislature just does not have a lot of oversight in what they do. That is an appointed board that is appointed by the governor. Um, they are unelected officials and we don't really you know they don't even have to tell us their rules so we may pass so how the legislature works is we pass a bill that bill gets implemented and then it goes to rulemaking and the rulemaking is made by the agency and then the rulemaking is overseen by the legislature to make sure that the rules that are being put in place of what we tried to pass well the, the state school board doesn't have to do that so you know and I'm not trying to say anything negative about them or anything negative about our local school board I'm just saying that's how it works and there's not a lot of oversight um, but let me interrupt very quickly. Is there, and I've asked this question to I think to Mike Height and others, is there a mood in the in uh, in Charleston the legislators uh, to revisit Amendment Four and put that back on a statewide referendum? Uh, as as a, um, a resident of Berkeley County, yes. I mean Berkeley County and I think Jefferson County were the only two counties that passed that. Um, I think that those when those um, constitutional amendments came up, I think that they were. There was too many of them, uh, and they were uh, the wording on them was very complicated. I will tell you, I was at a meeting one day, and I said something about, I don't know who wrote these constitutional amendments, but they're very confusing, and they weren't written very well. And Roger Hanshaw was in the room, and he had written yeah, a couple of them. Yeah. So I was a little embarrassed. But, you know, those come from a legal mind. It comes from a legal background. But, I, I you know, I think if those were run individually and people would understand more, you know, I think that, as I was saying uh Last week, and I think we got cut off. Either the legislature has been bleeding off power um, at an, an alarming rate. You know, we our last budget cycle was very unique because we had this clawback that was looming over us, and we had to kind of react in the middle of our budget cycle. Um, and we passed a skinny budget. Um, it was not a very um, not a very robust budget, and it was kind of like what we what we could do at the time. Um, so we just went back and we just did some supplemental spending. And to my dismay, the the last piece of legislation that was passed that went to DHS was a hundred and eighty million dollar spend with no line items in it. I, I I was flabbergasted. There was no controlled spending in it um, through line items. It basically gave the money to the secretary of DHS and said, "Spend it as you will," with no directive language for reimbursement rates and. So, you know, I, I was I gave a, a speech on the House floor and also in finance committee. I voted to get the bill out of finance to get it to the floor and said this this is a very dangerous precedent that we're setting here. And the bill almost died. I mean, it was within minutes of dying on the House floor. We almost adjourned Sonny die and let the bill die. But, um, you know, I, I this is the bill that you and Height, Mike Height, spoke against and uh, voted against. I, I did not. I did not speak against it. I. I stood up and said, vote your conscience and vote how you want to vote. But I was warning my fellow legislators that that we were setting a dangerous precedent um, as a finance committee and also as members of the legislature to be giving blind spending authority to a secretary when those budget items come out and they're usually line item. They're, they're, they're line item exactly how they're going to be spent within a certain amount of money. And for some reason, the Senate was all on board with giving this money to the secretary in this lump form. And I I still haven't been able to put that together, why the Senate was so hard pressed to put any of those line items back into that. And I've had I've not had any um, 
conversations with any of my Senate colleagues, but uh, they seem to be very hard pressed. And I don't know if that was an agreement that was made with the governor's office or, or what it was. It, it was a very strange special session. I hate special sessions because you usually get stuff jammed down your throat. You don't have enough time. You don't have enough information and you're spending hordes of money that you that you really need to be able to have a little bit more time to look at. What was the inside uh, baseball politics behind this, John? I understand that the speaker wanted the members of his delegation to vote a certain way. Uh, Mike Height, uh, however, wanted some changes made because he's pretty familiar, obviously, with IDD waivers and such. He went to the Senate uh, under the leadership of Craig Blair. The Senate sent back something that was disagreeable, I suppose, was the no line items in it. And basically it was past this or we're not going to act any any uh, further on it. And you guys had a choice of do it or let it die. Basically. Yeah, so the bill came out and it came to finance and, and Amy Summers, who's the chair of health, uh, and Mike Height and myself are both um, members of the health committee, um, looked at it and was quite concerned. And Amy is the one who put the amendment in in finance, um, and it passed. Uh, and then it went to the House floor, and we sent it to the Senate, and the Senate did not concur with our amendments and sent it back to us. Um, and at that point in time, it was either take the bill in the form that it was, because the Senate could have adjourned sine die, uh, and it was either take it or leave it, um, there was actually a motion to adjourn Sonny Die, and uh, a fellow delegate, um, a good friend of mine, Jonathan Penson, um, s- stood up and asked the speaker if we could please reconsider um, the motion to adjourn Sonny Die and reconsider the piece of legislation um, due to its importance and the money that you know was that was needed. Um, and there was about another two hours of debate that went on, and then ultimately the bill was passed. Um, I, I believe that the bill needed to pass, but I and I believe and I'm hopeful that this is a one-time occurrence that we're not building some type of precedent and having this open-ended spending on it. Uh, it was it was quite shocking for me to see something like that happen. I think the speaker was just trying to get it done, and I'm not going to speak for what Speaker Hanshaw was trying to do. I think he felt a little blindsided by the amendments. Um, but, you know, the, the House is a very finicky place to work, and they, you know, there's a lot of strong opinions in the House, and they don't really care what leadership has to say. And I've seen that as the, as the supermajority has, has grown. Um, you know, there's a lot of votes out there that uh, are independent and, and will vote the way they want, and they don't really care what House, what house leadership wants. So. Now, specifically, what did this bill fund besides just kind of giving the open checkbook? It just was an open checkbook to DHS for, for the money. I mean, there was no – those bills usually come to us in there in a complete line item form. It says X amount of dollars to this, and everything has account numbers. It's an agencies, and there's account numbers for each. And there, there's a name for the account, and then there's an account. So we know exactly what the maximum amount can be spent in those accounts. This was just wide open. And there was no directive language in the bill that X amount of dollars will be used for D, for the IDD waiver reimbursement program, which we were thought we were all there for. That's the reason we were there was for to shore up this IDD waiver program. So I think it kind of begs the question, John, the role of the legislature, <clears throat> excuse me, does it have all this oversight capability of all of these agencies is that your role as a legislator um to make sure that or do you entrust um the the individual agencies as big or as small as they may be to run their own program so to speak well i think it's a mix of both i I think it's um trust but verify um, you know, the, the governor, the governor really has a strong oversight of all the agencies and the agency spending. And we work very closely with the revenue secretary and, and the governor's financial staff. We also work very closely with all of the secretaries um, of all of the different agencies. And, you know, it's it's trust but verify. We, we have a budget hearing with every one of those agencies every year. We can go in and look at all of their line item spending. Um, we have a program. Uh, which is a very transparent program where we can go in and see how this money is spent. I believe, um, you know, I'm, I'm not advocating for a full-time legislature, but I think with the problems that our state is having, um, especially with education and uh, DHS right now, with the major problems that we are having, I believe that they're the, the finance chairman and the, the chairman of health and the education chairman, maybe even their vice chairs, 
of both the House and Senate should be full-time positions or at least have some type of more insight and oversight of exactly what's going on in those agencies, the day-to-day -day running of those agencies to see how that money is being spent. Because we know not only is some of the money not being spent where it's supposed to be spent, some of the reporting has been a little off and, and there's been some, some money's moved around. So, you know, I think that the legislature needs to make sure that they are doing their due diligence and representing their taxpayers and really for, uh, truly understanding exactly how this money is being spent. And, and we've been working on that. John, excuse me. Uh, Mike Hornby uh, uh, text in said that there were stop gaps in this bill to ensure the dollars were correctly spent. In this case, that's <coughs> Delegate Mike Hornby. Delegate Mike Hornby, exactly. Yeah, right. but it's not line item like it usually is. So, um, Tell Hornby to stick to education. Hardy's the finance oh. guy. <laughs> oh, so, but it was not line. Oh. It was not line he item. He probably heard you, John. Yeah. <laughs> it was not line item like these bills typically yeah. come out. I did. So when when these bills come out from the governor's office, there is line items exactly how that yeah. money is going to be spent, and there was no directive language and how much money would be put into the IDD waiver program. I love you, Mike Hornby. I want yeah. you to know, Mike, the opinions of some of our guests are not necessarily the opinions of the hosts of the show. So just don't hold that against me. Uh, John, my understanding is that between now and the end of the governor's term, you're going to have a changeover in Senate leadership uh, as well. Uh, who knows what the future of the House is? But my understanding is that the governor wants some big things accomplished between now and January when he has to give up the seat to go to uh, to go to the Senate. Any idea what some of those things might be that he wants funded? Well, there'll be a massive amount of spending. I mean, if the governor has his way, I mean, you know, I, I'm leaving the legislature, but I will be there. There's there's talk of a special session in August. Um, and I'm sure the governor is going to want to do a massive amount of spending before he leaves office. He's not going to leave anything for the next governor. Uh, the governor's sitting on uh, quite a bit of, uh, of special or of his own revenue, um, the governor's contingency fund. Uh, I've written a few letters asking for money for Berkeley County. Um, you know, everyone knows that there's money available and everyone's asking. Um, so I had just sent a letter yesterday, as a matter of fact, asking for a half a million dollars for a courthouse expansion for a courthouse pro program that the, the county has. Uh, uh, I've asked for some money for um, uh, Panhandle Home Health, need some help with some technology stuff. Uh, there's, there's lots of need. Uh, the governor just came and gave a million dollars to the Boys and Girls Club. So the governor's out, uh, you know, spending that money and, and, and peddling votes. Yeah. But uh, so, no, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the governor's going to be asking for. A lot, some, it's it's going to be a lot of spend in education and probably a lot of spend in DHS. Um, the governor loves food pantry programs. I'm not exactly sure what all he's going to ask for. But the, the legis there's going to be a huge surplus of money. When this budget year is over, there's going to be a huge surplus of money that's left over. And the governor's going to want to spend every dime of it. And I'm hopeful that the legislature will hold the line um, and try to be able to um, use those monies for one-time expenditures. Sometimes we stick money in Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid is a good placeholder for money. We can stick money there. And if the governor spends the $800 million projected surplus, does that mean no further income tax cut this year? Well, the, you'd have to talk to Eric Householder about that income tax cut. He, he is the person who put that together, and that is a very complicated – uh, it's, it's a very complicated formula, and and it's 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 somewhat challenging to meet those triggers, and I th and that's good. That's a good thing. So like, um, delegate householder um, was able to pull the severance tax out of that. That was all of, all of our volatility. So it's based on you know certain percentages and numbers. Um, I, I don't know if we're going to hit those. If we do hit it, I don't think it'll be the ten percent. I think that that is very much designed to be. Uh, um, of a trigger that can be that can be accomplished, but can be accomplished through um, being very responsible. Yeah, uh, salaries something we keep coming back to, especially teacher salaries. And there have been some increases done to teachers statewide, but when we compare it to what's been done in Virginia and Maryland, it is a drop in the budget. We're getting farther and farther behind these. Locality pay is kind of a fallback position that may someday happen but then again it may not happen how do we address the the teacher pay gap i will tell you that uh, you know we've we've done five pay raises throughout since i've been in the legislature there's been five pay raises for all public 
um, employees, ten thousand dollar pay raise for state troopers. Uh, the state has has done a really good job of keeping up on pay raises in other parts of the state. Um, Berkeley County and Jefferson County will never, never be able to compete with Loudoun County. Um, and Fairfax County and Frederick County, we will never be able to compete with them. Our taxes are not what their taxes are. We don't tax the way they tax. Um, I don't know if locality pay is something that ever happens. Uh, as I've stated before, I don't know if there's just a piece of legislation that says, you know, that there's going to be a, a special pay for different locations. I think that that's going to have to be written into legislation um, uh, through the agencies will have to make those decisions and there'll be X amount of dollars for the agencies. It's going to be very hard for the legislature to make the education um, agencies be able to do that because we don't have a lot of oversight over them. Um, so, you know, we've worked really hard to try to get salaries better. Um, I, I don't think all the problems in the education system is salary. A lot of it is just complete disrespect and disregard from students and parents and, and a certain percentage of student and parents, and we could do another whole show on that. There, there definitely needs to be some changes made. Yeah, and I think you're exactly right because we like to have the the organizations as close to this uh, end of people as we can get it. In education, that's not the case. The well, power base is with the state board of education as opposed to the local board of education. And, and, you know, I have enough knowledge to be dangerous here. So 1990, 1996, I worked for the Jefferson County Board of Education. Um, locality pay was something we talked about then. Then I went to the journal for a lot of years, and I wrote editorial after editorial of locality pay. And I remember then people saying, well, we don't have the, we don't have the chutzpah. It, you know, we don't have the numbers in the legislature to really push that. Well, then we got the numbers and we still can't get it. Um, so, and I get that there's lots of different stuff going on, but geez. Well, you may have a governor. Yeah. Yeah, we, we were gaining. We were gaining mm -hmm. on it. We got that vote up to around, I think we gained that vote to about 42 or 43. Okay. So we were gaining, but now you're looking at a whole new legislature. Absolutely. Um, you know. But maybe a Republican governor out of the Eastern Panhandle, too. Yeah, I was very hopeful in the last governor's um, state of the state that we would hear something about yeah. locality pay, but I think the governor played that so flat. But but, uh, but you, you made a good point. Only part of the problem is with the salaries. Amen. We have other problems, and I yeah. think that's a structural, organizational structure. John Hardy, good to see you again. Thank you all very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for coming in. That's Delegate John Hardy.